Welcome back to class. This is practical training for the College of Natural Health Sciences Bermuda. My name is Dr. Delcina Bean Burroughs and this is lecture number seven where we will be considering how to evaluate the lower extremity. The lecture seven objectives are that at the end of today's lecture students will be able to identify the bony and soft tissue landmarks of the lower extremity perform a basic lower extremity evaluation that includes foot posture and gait analysis, skin inspection, joint range of motion of the hip, knee, ankle, and toes, and special test Patrick's and leg length discrepancy tests, manual muscle testing, arterial pulses test, capillary refills test, deep tendon reflex testing, and sensation testing. Now it should be noted that for all the material covered in today's lecture, we will go over this and we will perform it in our practical training labs. So you have the lecture notes, but then it will be reinforced in our lab classes. We begin today's lecture with a review of the healing touch model. The healing touch model or HTM is defined as the purposeful use of the hands to provide care that supports and promotes the health and well-being of the client. It seeks to engage the client or patient as much as possible in the process of being touched. The healing touch model has six modes of touch interaction. They are support and comfort, facilitate, guiding, investigating, teaching, and alliance building. We also discussed how the HTM is founded upon two underlying precursors that precede touch interactions. The first is to obtain the patient or the client's consent. The healthcare provider must obtain consent from the client before initiating touch interactions. By obtaining the client's consent, we demonstrate respect for the client and the client's right to accept or deny help. The second is body alignment. The head, neck, trunk, and pelvis must be aligned as much as possible before attempting to administer sustained touch interactions. This applies to all sitting, standing, and lying down positions. When the body is properly aligned, the patient feels more secure, empowered, and less vulnerable during sustained touch interactions. We also discussed how graded touch is used to carry out the healing touch model. It involves the skillful and intentional use of applying the hands in order to bring about a desired and favorable outcome to the benefit of the client. There are six components of graded touch, and this includes the healthcare provider's general appearance, grooming and hygiene, hand temperature, hand moistness versus dryness, hand texture, contouring, and pressure. In addition, we discuss the healthcare provider's touch interactions that they must be perceived by the client as being diagnostic, caring, assistive, therapeutic, calming, relaxing, efficient, skillful, gentle, and most of all, non-threatening. We defined rough touch as being any patient-client interaction that does not promote healing by way of touch. Some encounters with clients may be painful due to the procedure being performed. However, the client must correctly interpret the difference between pain that is caused by the procedure versus pain being triggered by the clinician's manner of touch. And finally, we also discussed prohibitive touch that it goes without saying that the following touch strokes should never be used during any client or patient interaction. 
These include intentional tickling, caressing for the purposes of stimulating sexual arousal, pinching, punching, hitting, pulling, pushing, scratching, smacking, slapping, thumping, hard rubbing, and washing, wiping, or cleaning the genital and anal areas without obtaining the client's consent and or performing these activities when the client does not require assistance. Let's discuss infection control measures. The hands of the therapist must be thoroughly washed before touching the client. In almost all cases, you will wash your hands in front of the client to demonstrate that you are following infection control procedures. So in the case when you see your client initially for the initial consultation and you have to take information in during the client interview process, after you have taken and written down all the information, you will then wash your hands in front of the client so that they can see that you are following infection control procedures. And then depending on the type of evaluation you will be performing, it may be necessary to wear medical gloves. Other infection control measures to be followed include wearing a face mask or shield, avoid touching other surfaces once you put your gloves on, and disposing of contaminated personal protective equipment or PPE in hazardous waste bins. Now let's look at surface anatomy of the lower extremity. So to begin our review of surface anatomy of the lower extremity, we first take this anterior view of the lower extremity, beginning most superiorly from the left-hand side, we can see the vastus lateralis, we can see the tibial tuberosity, we also see the patella, and then most superiorly, we see the sartorius muscle. We also see the adductors. We see the rectus femoris and we see the vastus medialis. And from this posterior view, beginning most superiorly on the left hand side, we see the tensa fasciolata. We see the vastus lateralis. We also see the biceps femoris and the biceps femoris tendon. And then most superiorly beginning from the right hand side, we see the gluteus maximus, followed by the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. We also see the gastrocnemius. And here we have a lateral view of the lower extremity, primarily the leg. We see the biceps femoris tendon most superiorly. And then over to the left, we see the tibialis anterior. We see the lateral malleolus. We also see the extensor digitorum longus tendons, and we see the fibularis brevis tendon. And then most superiorly on the right-hand side, we see the soleus. We also see the fibularis longus. We also see the fibularis brevis, and we see the fibularis longus tendon. Now let's briefly review the osseous anatomy of the lower extremity, beginning with the femur bone, the patella bone, the tibia, and the fibula. Let's now review the osseous anatomy of the foot. As we can see, the foot is divided into the tarsal bones, the metatarsal bones, and the phalanges. When we look to the left, inferiorly, we see the talus bone, which sits on top of the calcaneus bone. The calcaneus bone is the largest bone of the foot. And superiorly, we can see the cuneiforms. We can also see the navicular and the cuboid. Continuing to travel superiorly, we see the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth metatarsal bones, which have a clear and distinct head, a shaft, and a base. And then, continuing to travel superiorly, we see the phalanges. 
with the exception of the first phalange, which has the uh, hallux bone, we see that the other bones are divided into the distal phalanx, the middle phalanx, and the proximal phalanx. So in terms of the lower extremity evaluation, and this is a very general evaluation of the lower extremity, when we look at evaluating the foot, it will be far more extensive. However, these are the general categories that we look at. So we assess the health of the lower extremity by observation and evaluation in the following areas. General appearance, gait abnormalities, foot posture, skin inspection, palpation of the bony and soft tissue landmarks, joint range of motion, manual muscle testing, arterial pulses, capillary refill test, deep tendon reflex testing, and sensation testing. And we will go into more detail for each of these categories in the following slides. So we begin our lower extremity evaluation by assessing the general appearance of a client and you're going to look for obvious signs of abnormalities. Are there any awkward postures? Are there any gait imbalances or abnormalities? Is there any sign of uh, antalgia, which is limping when the person walks? You're going to also check out their footwear to see what kind of footwear they're using. They may be using some kind of special uh, shoe. Also, you're going to see if they are wearing any special kind of clothing Depending on what type of footwear they uh, have on, you may be able to assess the arches of the foot, the foot posture. And uh, so if, the, if they're wearing sandals, for example, you might be able to see, do they have an overly high arch uh, or are they relatively flat footed or does it look normal? You're also going to check to see if there are any signs of any amputations. Are there any nudid deformities such as bunions or hammer toes or obvious corns or things like that that uh, are very, very obvious? You're also going to look at their skin to see if there's any lesions, bleeding, gashes, uh, redness, which is erythema, and uh, swelling. Any sign of that at all in the lower extremity? Are they using any orthotics such as AFOs, knee brace, or uh, ankle brace, any, any type of uh, orthotic device? You're going to take note of that. And of course, are they using any assistive devices such as a cane or crutches? So, uh, or, or maybe even a walker, let's, you know, we, it, it's a possibility. So all of these things you're going to uh, check out when you do your general appearance and you're going to make note of these things right away. When assessing foot posture, the height of the foot arches is observed. You want to check for changes in foot arches upon sitting when the person is at rest, standing when they are weight bearing, and during the gait cycle. Ask the client if there is foot pain when sitting, standing, or walking. Now we look to assess the gait. One gait cycle begins from heel strike of one foot to the heel strike of the same foot. The gait cycle is broken into two phases. The stance phase is 62% of the gait cycle, while the swing phase is 38% of the gait cycle. The stance phase is further divided into three parts. The first is the contact period, which is 30% heel strike to full four foot landing. The second is the mid stance period, which is 40% of the stance phase, full four foot load to the heel lift. And then the third aspect of the stance phase is the propulsion period, which is 30% of the stance phase. And it is from heel to toe off. The swing phase is when the foot or the leg is now in ground contact. When observing the gait of our clients, look for smoothness of phases, 
rhythm, timing, ease of shifting from one phase to the next, symmetry, and limb postures. In terms of skin inspection, we assess the intactness and general condition of the integumentary system by observing for any of the following. Broken skin, abrasions, protrusions, gouges and blisters, lesions, discolorations, bruises and contusions and signs of infection, temperature and texture, hot, redness, swelling, cold, clammy, dry patches, flakes, wetness and perspiration, vitality, which is a thickness, firmness, and if there are any wrinkles, and note while the skin between the toes, look for corns and calluses and fungi above, beneath, or on the sides of the foot and toes, and also check for discolored or deformed toenails. Now let's discuss palpating the bony and soft tissue landmarks. The bony and soft tissue landmarks that receive priority for palpation during a lower extremity evaluation are the anterior superior iliac spine, the ASIS, the femoral condyles, the patella, the popliteal fossa, the medial and lateral malleoluses, the tarsal bones, the MTP joints, the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. Now let's consider joint range of motion for the lower extremity. Range of motion is the extent of movement that is available at a joint, measured in degrees of a circle. Joint movement is either active, passive, or a combination of both. The goniometer is used to measure specific joint range of motion after general range of motion is observed. The joints of the lower extremity that commonly are assessed include the coxal joint, which is a hip joint, the tibiofemoral joint, which is the knee joint, the talocrural joint, which is the ankle, the metatarsal phalangeal joint of the great toe, and the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. When assessing the general health of the lower extremity, one special test that is often used is the Patrick or Faber test. The aim of the test is to identify dysfunction of the hip and sacroiliac joints, such as mobility restriction. The client lays supine and is passively flexed, abducted, and externally rotated so that the foot is resting above the opposite knee. A positive sign is when the knee is unable to assume the relaxed position and or there is reproduction of painful symptoms. The leg length discrepancy test is also measured when joint range of motion is evaluated. The aim of this test is to identify a true leg length discrepancy. The client lies supine and the pelvis is balanced and aligned with the lower limbs and the trunk. The distance from the anterior superior iliac spine to the medial malleolus on each limb is measured several times for consistency and the results are compared. A positive sign is when there is a difference in length between the two limbs and it's identifying a leg length discrepancy. This test will determine if the limb discrepancy is true or functional. True discrepancy is caused by an anatomical difference in the bone lengths, either the tibia or the femur bone. Functional discrepancies are not anatomical in origin and are the result of compensation due to abnormal position or posture, such as pronation of the foot or pelvic obliquity. Now let's consider manual muscle testing for the lower extremity. Manual muscle testing, or MMT, of the lower extremity involves the application of force to muscles or groups of muscles in order to determine the baseline strength of the muscles. 
MMT gives us an indication of the functioning of the central nervous system along with the fitness level as well as other factors. When conducting manual muscle testing for the lower extremity, muscle groups should be isolated on one limb at a time. The muscles of the hip, thigh, leg, and foot are all tested in a lower extremity evaluation. The most commonly tested muscles in a lower extremity evaluation include the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the gastrocnemius, and the tibialis anterior. The arterial pulses are also evaluated during a lower extremity evaluation. We can do this by way of palpating the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial arteries. However, the pedal artery Doppler exam device is used to check the pulses and to give more accurate information than what can be deemed during regular palpation. As holistic health practitioners, we should look to purchase a pedal Doppler as soon as finances allow, as this device can be quite costly. So let's talk about the waveforms of the Doppler. There is what we refer to as a triphasic waveform. In the normal artery, you will hear three sounds, and this is referred to as triphasic. The normal Doppler velocity waveform is made up of three components, which correspond to different phases of arterial flow. The rapid antegrade flow reaching a peak during systole and the transient reversal of flow during early diastole and the slow antegrade flow during late diastole. And of course we have what's referred to as biphasic waveform and this indicates mild to moderate disease and monophasic flow indicates significant disease. So there are only two sounds that are audible and visible of the wavelength of the Doppler. Most seniors tend to be biphasic and this is due to the decrease of elasticity of their arteries over time. With monophasic waveforms, a waveform of each segment of the vascular tree helps localize any occlusion or stenosis. The waveform should be triphasic, corresponding to the three phases of a heartbeat, as I mentioned, diastole, systole, diastole, elastic recoil. Monophasic flow indicates significant disease. So when you come across a situation where there is monophasic wave flow that you're picking up your readings with your Doppler, this is an immediate referral. You want to make sure that it is an immediate referral to the GP so that they can uh, get this attended to because as we said, it will be indicative of significant disease. Let's talk about the ankle brachial index test. This test, or the uh, ABI, as it's referred to in abbreviated form, is a simple test that compares the blood pressure in the upper and lower limbs. Healthcare providers calculate the ABI by dividing the blood pressure in an artery of the ankle by the blood pressure in an artery of the arm, and the result is the ABI. Now, the validity of the ABI depends on the same conditions as carrying out the capillary refill test. In other words, the client is lying down, they haven't smoked within the last half an hour of you performing the test, they have not eaten within the last two hours, the room is warm, it's, uh, it's room temperature, in other words, they're not sitting in a uh, cold room. The right size cuff is also uh, to be used. And in terms of clinical reasoning, the ABI may not be the best test to use if significant arterial disease is present. The medial arterial uh, calcinosis and microvascular disease and microvascular disease, if any of these things are present, this test may not be the best test to be performed. So uh, in medial arterial calcification, 
which is also known as Monkenberg arteriosclerosis, is a condition that leads to stiffening of the elastic layer of the arterial wall. But in contrast to intimal calcification, it does not obstruct the arterial lumen. So this is the reason why this test may not always be the best test to uh, conduct. Let's talk about the toe Doppler pressures. A Doppler device and a smith manometer are used to measure systolic pressure in the arm and the great toe. Toe Dopplers are commonly used in patients with diabetes and peripheral artery disease. A toe brachial pressure index, which is also referred to as the TBPI, is a non-invasive way of determining arterial perfusion in feet and toes. And the TPI may be a more appropriate test to use in place of the ABI. So in terms of a normal TBI, in general, a toe pressure of 70 to 110 milligrams of mercury or the TBI, which is greater than 0.5 to 0.75, is considered normal, and anything below is diagnostic of uh, peripheral artery disease. A toe pressure lower than 30 milligrams of pressure, or TBI, is 0.2, is considered severely ischemic and diagnostic of critical limb ischemia. A toe systolic pressure greater than 30 milligrams of mercury may be an indicator that there is healing potential in a foot with ulcers. A normal TBI differs from a normal ABI because the normal blood pressure in the big toe, the hallux, is expected to be less than at the ankle or the arm. If the TBI is below 0.65, there is reduced blood flow in the small vessels in the big toe. Let's first talk about the capillary refill test or the CRT. This is a rapid test used for assessing the blood flow through the peripheral tissues. It's a quick test performed on the nail beds to monitor the amount of blood flow to the tissues as well as dehydration. So by following these steps, this is the procedure for the test. You first want to make sure that the person isn't wearing any nail polish or any uh, toe rings or finger rings, but we're more concerned about uh, the toe because that's where we'll be performing the test as foot health practitioners. And the therapist then compresses the nail bed until it turns white and records the time taken for the collar to return to the nail bed. It normally takes three seconds or less. And when it takes longer, there is what we refer to as being uh, arterial insufficiency, it's what we suspect. So we always want to compare the normal side of the hand and the foot or the fingers and toes, okay? And in order for this test to be valid, the client has to be lying down. Uh, they must not have smoked within the last half an hour of you performing the test. Also, they should not have eaten within the last two hours. The room temperature needs to be warm, you know, needs to be room temperature. In other words, they can't be sitting in a cold room because that's going to affect the validity of the test. Okay, so the uh, CR test is a test that you as a foot health practitioner will perform. So now let's talk about the deep tendon reflex testing. There are five primary deep tendon reflexes, the biceps, the brachioradialis, the triceps, the patella, and the ankle. Each reflex corresponds to a particular root and muscle and will evaluate the integrity of the root and the associated nerve. For our purposes, when it comes to the lower extremity evaluation, we are primarily concerned with the deep tendon reflexes of the patella, and the ankle. 
So we will perform this in our practical training lab and you will become quite proficient in performing this test. Now let's discuss assessing the legs and feet for temperature. Temperature is checked for discrepancies between 2.9 to 6.5 degrees from one part of the leg or foot to another part of the same leg or foot, or from one foot or leg to the other leg or foot. Noted discrepancies are problematic. Temperature should be monitored by the client, particularly after wound healing. Discrepancies could be a sign of new ulceration development. Temperature checking may be a good clinical indicator if erythema is not yet observable. Now let's discuss sensation. The lower extremity is assessed for sensation along the hip, thigh, leg, and foot. A dermatome is an area of skin in which sensory nerves derive from a single spinal nerve root. Sensory information from a specific dermatome is transmitted by the sensory nerve fibers to the spinal nerve of a specific segment of the spinal cord. The entire lower extremity must be evaluated for sensation in the following areas, hot and cold, sharp and dull, light touch and pain, localization and two-point discrimination, sustained pressure, kinesthesia, proprioception, and vibration. The items used to conduct the evaluation include hot and cold test tubes, cotton balls, toothpicks, two-point discrimination anesthesiometers, and tuning forks. So when we do the test for sensory neuropathy, one of the things we're going to perform is the vibratory test. This is uh, done with a tuning fork. And what happens, the tuning fork vibrates at a set frequency after being struck on the heel of the hand and is used to assess the vibratory sensation. And it is performed over the bony prominences of the lower extremity. So you want to make sure that you start distally at the first MPJ and you want to move to the malleolus if there is a poor response. And the client will indicate how long the vibratory sensation was sensed. And we will learn all about how you uh, document their response when we do the practical. But the vibratory test is one of the first tests that we would do in terms of detecting uh, sensory neuropathy in the foot. So let's talk about the 5.07 10 gram monofilament test, which is the test that we will do to check for the loss of protective sensation in the foot. According to the American Diabetes Association, all patients with diabetes should be screened for the loss of protective sensation in their feet. And of course, we're not just going to test uh, persons with uh, diabetes, but this is just something that the uh, American Diabetes Association is always recommending. And uh, when they are diagnosed, when the client is diagnosed with uh, diabetes, they believe that they should be tested for uh, the loss of protective sensation uh, annually on an annual basis after the diagnosis has been made. And of course, there are 10 test sites on each foot and you will see them illustrated here. The monofilaments, however, they do lose their compressive forces after 100 times of being used. And so when you have one monofilament, you can think of it as only being good for about maybe 10 clients. And then you have to get rid of them and um, get, get new ones so that you're always uh, testing with the uh, same compressive force as as much as possible and uh, you know it will put the test in order for it to be valid and of course this is something that we will practice in our practical lab now how do you use the monofilament well you want to make sure that you place the monofilament perpendicular 
to the area until it bends and then you lift it off and you ask the client did the did they feel the sensation and uh, when we do the practical lab we will go over how you actually document uh, their response but uh, essentially it's it's perpendicular you will hold the monofilament perpendicular to the area until it bends and then you're going to lift it off and of course the monofilament will have been uh, something that was in your uh, in your clinical instrument packet that you received. Let's talk about the proprioception test of the great toe, the hallux. This test measures the position sense of the great toe and how you carry this one out is you isolate the great toe on the side with the client's vision occluded or you ask the client to uh, close their eyes and then you ask the client if the toe is positioned up or down. And some practitioners uh, test the smaller toes as well in relation to the big toe. They will grab all of the other toes, the other four toes, and uh, position them away from the big toe and ask the person whether or not they are up or down. But in this case, it, you really want to test for the sensitivity of the great toe because that is the uh, most important uh, feeler, if you will, or sensation uh, that goes through the great toe when it comes to things like walking and, and uh, sensing uh, objects that may be in the shoe or what have you. And you want to know that the person can sense what relation their toe is at any given time. So we will cover the proprioception test when we do our practical. We will, we obviously we will practice this and we will uh, demonstrate it in our practical training class. When it comes to the clinical reasoning process in performing a lower extremity evaluation, there will be times when it becomes necessary to consider whether it is appropriate to carry out the lower extremity evaluation at the designated time acute injury, active exacerbation or flare-up of symptoms from a health condition, heavy menstruation, uncontrolled bowel or bladder incontinence, and recent emotional trauma or life-changing events are all indicators that perhaps this is not the time to carry out the evaluation. The best course of action may be to either postpone the evaluation to another time or perform the evaluation in part, or even you may have to refer the client to another health practitioner whose scope of practice is better suited to the client's needs. Okay, so we've reached the end of our lecture and for assignment number seven, I'd like for you in an essay of no less than 400 words Discuss how the healing touch model is implemented when performing a lower extremity evaluation. What are the infection control measures to be implemented during the evaluation? Describe the areas that are to be assessed as part of the lower extremity evaluation. And state what factors must be taken into consideration as a part of the lower extremity evaluation during the clinical reasoning process. And as always, if you have any difficulty at all with this assignment, you may email me or send me a text message. My office hours are on Thursdays from 4 to 6 p.m. And I look forward to receiving your assignments. And with that, do have a good week.